Hello everybody, my name is Claire Matheson and I'm the coordinator for the Thames Valley Learning Partnership. I'd like to welcome you all here today to this social media speaker webinar, Tackling Trolling and Online Hate with Imran Ahmed. Imran is the founding CEO of the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, as well as being a trustee at the UK charity Victim Support. He is an expert in this field and regularly features in the media to discuss malignant behaviour and how people use digital spaces to harm others. He was raised in Manchester and advises politicians in the UK, US and Europe on policy and legislation. Before I hand you over to Imran, please can I ask you to submit any questions you may have using the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to answer these at the end of his talk. Thank you. Over to you, Imran. Uh, good afternoon. Um... My name is Imran Ahmed. Um, I'm Chief Executive of the Centre for Countering Digital Hate and I founded it uh, two and a half years ago. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about how social media affects uh, us as people, um, in particular our mental health and in particular for young people. Now you're going to have to forgive me, I haven't been young for a long time so I'm, I've been racking my brain somewhat trying to remember all the things I felt, but the truth is that many of the malignancies that we see online affect um, young people in a similar way um, to the way that adults feel social media. We uh, experience online bullying, trolling, racism, sexism, uh, the impact on body and self image, uh, and as well, it, it's difficult to find sources of help so let me speak to you as i would to anyone i'm advising on these issues and we provide advice to organizations as diverse as the scientists who worked on the covid vaccine those incredible minds who despite their incredible endeavors were targeted with um, abuse and hatred uh, the two all the way to ceos of large organizations who don't understand the reasons behind the trolling they see and can often take it far too literally. You'd be shocked if I told you how many decision makers allow themselves to be impacted by one malcontent uh, or someone motivated by the desire to harm others uh, online. So let me start off with the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Um, I set up the well, I set up the precursor to the center, uh, an analysis unit, trying to understand what had happened to our world and why it was that digital malignant movements. So basically, bad people were able to use digital spaces to create enormous amounts of harm. And we've seen that over the past few years in a number of ways, but perhaps most acutely, in the political sphere, um, we've seen a rise of an intolerance, a, a uh, distastefully violent uh, and aggressive and um, negative way of thinking and talking that platforms themselves have realized actually originates in the mechanisms in the way that their platforms are organized. Um, but we've also seen it with the pandemic, where we've seen the rapid flow of disinformation, of lies, intentional lies that have undermined people's confidence in the science that has actually protected billions of people. Um, and we were set up to try and work out, well, what was going wrong and what can we do about it? Now, there's, a, there's actually a, a slightly uh, cynical underpinning to the reasons we started the way that we did. We kind of figured that um, most politicians were too old to get what was going on. Um, I know I seem old to you, but believe me, I am to you as they are to me. So um, I, we figured that we needed to start providing advice to people that was rooted in the realities of how social media platforms work. And the truth is that you spend more time and have spent more of your life uh, as a percentage of it on social media than I have. Um, we launched with a report called Don't Feed the Trolls that was 
incredibly successful because it explained the mathematical underpinnings of why people would troll and be abusive online. Why it is that trolling and abuse can actually mathematically amplify the visibility of that abuse in the first instance. And it, we were really proud because that report came out and it was endorsed almost immediately by people as diverse as the Mayor of London to ministers in the uh, coalition government to uh, Gary Lineker um, and lots of people beyond that who kind of saw immediately the logic that underpinned it. And I'll go through some of that logic shortly. You know, um, now, uh, two and a half years later, our work is used by President Biden. It's used by legislators, the people who make laws all over the world. Um, it's used by the, in the media extensively. And I spend an enormous amount of my time trying to find ever more elaborate ways to hide my double chin on television. Um, but uh, one of the things I get asked is, what do you actually think of social media? Do you like it? I mean, personally, I, I have a Twitter profile, which uh, I don't use a lot. I, theoretically, I have an Instagram profile, but no one knows what it is. Um, I don't have a Facebook account. But I think social media is an incredible uh, gift to humanity. And, and I mean, that's used advisedly, that's lofty praise. But its ability to connect people and allow them to not just connect bilaterally, so with each other, but multilaterally to create communities in digital spaces in which you can feel a sense of friendship, of common interest, of common purpose is, is incredible. It's a, it, it's down to a fundamental shift in the economics of communication that might seem bizarre to someone of your ages because there was a world in which the price of a communication was not zero and that's what it is now the fundamental shift is that the cost of each additional communication to each additional person has been reduced to zero and that is the phenomenal progress that we've made through the through digital technology. But what we've realized over time is that whereas the economic cost is zero, the social cost can be quite significant. Because of course, when you allow anyone to connect to anyone, you also allow predators to connect to their prey. You allow bad people to masquerade as responsible members of a community when in fact their aim is much more malignant, is evil, whether that is to spread misinformation that might lead to people dying, or it is the misinformation that all too often underpins hate. Because hate, let me be frank, is based for the main part on exaggerations, on misrepresentations, and outright lies. And we've tracked the evolution of people who've ended up committing terrible crimes, going from being well-informed to being misinformed, to being hateful, to committing acts which are intolerable in a decent society, hate crimes. And we speak to people every day who've been harmed by social media and they talk to us about their experiences, how it feels to be the victim of hate, to be the victim of misinformation. We speak to parents who are worried about the impact it's having on young people's mental health and self-image. We speak to parents whose children have died as a result of the pandemic. We speak to people whose husbands have been lost to misinformation and conspiracy theories, lies which have torn apart families. And there are two things that we've learned over time. First of all, we have to be more aware in digital spaces of the presence of bad actors, of people with malignant intent. 
and to understand what motivates them. And the second is to understand that when we are on social media platforms, the greatest lie that's ever been told about social media is that social media is free speech. Social media is highly structured speech. Those environments from the beginning have been designed to serve not communication, but advertising. I mean, every time you use social media, the price that you pay is your data is being taken and used to be sold to companies who then have want to advertise to you. Now, for the most of most part, that's fairly innocuous. You know, you get recommended a pair of chinos. It so happens that you've been Googling for some chinos earlier. That can actually be advantageous, but it can also be sold in much more malevolent ways, in ways which you wouldn't be comfortable with. Data can be tracked about you that you don't know is being tracked about you. I bet you wouldn't know this, but most of the time when you're going across any website, there are embedded pixels from those big social media platforms tracking your activity there as well. And we conducted a study of the algorithms that are then used to order information on those platforms. Now, look, if your job is to sell as much advertising as possible, advertising is a simple advertising revenue is a really, really simple calculation. It's cost per advert. So how much someone pays to put an advert on the platform multiplied by the number of users. Because, of course, you want to people want to be able to target as many people as possible, multiplied by the time spent on platform. And that's how you work out your total revenue figure as an as, a, as, a, as how much money you can make as a social media platform. And social media platforms are designed to keep us on there for as long as possible. And it's really important to remember that, first of all, they're addictive, not because of some weird quirk of psychology, because they're designed to be addictive. When they were first being planned out, some of the initial thinking behind social media came from the Behavioral Institute unit at Stanford University in California by a guy called, I'm sure someone's going to snigger, BJ Fogg, um, who is the father of what's called persuasive technology. Think about that for a second. There is a laboratory in a Southern Californian university whose job it is to think specifically about how to persuade you using technology. And that's where a lot of the ideas that underpin modern social media experience come from. Um, I know their hands being raised. I'm, I, I, am, I, I know I run the Center for Counter Digital Hate. I absolutely hate using digital platforms. So I don't know what that means, but I'm going to carry on regardless. Um, and we, we, we do a lot of studies of, well, how, do, how have they designed that experience? How does the algorithm work? How do the algorithms are really simple. They're mathematical equations. They basically say, what do you want people to see? And how do you then order their experience on that platform? And I mean, social media platforms, you'll know, you don't actually get a timeline. You don't literally see the last thing that was posted from the 50 people that you follow, the 100 people that you follow. You see an ordered timeline. And that timeline is ordered by the companies which decide, remembering, going back to, why is it that they want, to, what, why is it that they produce these platforms? They spend enormous amounts of money and, and energy and electricity and uh, on Put you on, on making you able to access those platforms. They do it because they want you to stay there. They do it because they, they want you to stay there so they can serve you advertising. The platforms order information in a very specific way. So what comes top? Things that get you emotional. They discovered that what makes you angry keeps you engaged. And that's partly because they could study our own behavior. When they were giving us raw timelines, it was the things that made us emotional that made us carry on clicking and scrolling down. And um, we've studied the algorithms using a series of studies, setting up profiles, looking at what the algorithm recommends, clicking on one like and seeing what happens next. And 
it's really clear. The algorithms are written in a way that's extremely effective in sending particular types of information to you. In particular, hate, controversy, and misinformation. And that's going to sound a little bit bananas to you. It might even sound like a conspiracy theory. Like, why would they give us conspiracy theories? So there's some science behind this. Conspiracy theories are really, really well correlated. So that, 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 that people are more likely to believe a conspiracy theory if they're feeling anxious and confused. But it never fills the gap. So a conspiracy theory is, is basically something based on a lie. It's a conspiracy, sure, but theory is the most important thing. There's no fact to back it up yet. So it's really a leap of faith. And if you think about that anxiety that I described, that sort of desperate yearning to know what on earth is going on, you're looking for big answers. And conspiracy theories provide catchy solutions, but they're not based on facts. So they never sate, they never satisfy that craving, that desperate yearning to know what's true and what's not. So you end up looking for more and more and more conspiracy theories. Now, from the outside, we call that rabbit holing. You've heard probably or read in the news of someone who went down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. That's the psychological mechanism that underpins it. And guess what? The platforms know that. So we found that they were serving up conspiracy theories to people, suggesting they start following them because the algorithms, by analyzing trillions of clicks, knew that that was the most addictive. And the apps and the platforms now know that this is true. We've provided the research. There's been independent research. We've discovered through whistleblowers that they've conducted their own internal research and found this to be true. And yet they haven't done anything about it. It feeds people huge amounts of content on a single topic, but it only gives you fast food. And sometimes you need to have a balanced meal. Social media won't provide that to you. Now, how that can affect you is really serious because of course, receiving this kind of misinformation, seeing the controversial, the hateful frequently has started to change our society and make us believe that it's acceptable to behave in those sorts of ways. Again, the psychology behind it, something, something called frequency bias. If we see something frequently, we think it's true. We think it's acceptable. We think it's normal. And the normalization of hate, of controversy, of disagreement, is what I mean when I say controversy, and misinformation. And misinformation is really about trying to persuade them of a, someone of a case without, without doing the hard work of establishing facts for it. These th three things combined are having a significant impact on what we understand to be normal in our society. I mean, I, I wasn't really sure where I was going to go with this speech, to be honest, because I'm really good at describing the problem. But let me perhaps indulge me for a moment when I advise you as young people moving into a world in which, which my generation, generations before me have created and left for you in the same way that we've also left you with crises and things like climate. And I am sorry. I'm sorry that this is the world that's being left to you, that the information ecosystem, the world in which you will consume information is decided in this kind of way. Facebook's own research shows that this has changed the way that we behave to each other. And it's not acceptable. In fact, it's counterthetical to all the progress we've made over centuries. The establishment of the scientific method, the bringing of minorities into public life, the civility and social norms that we've sought to establish so that we have prosperous, peaceful, progressive societies, societies that constantly grow in our accumulated wisdom, wealth, and ability to empower every individual. And it will be your, your world to inherit. It'll be your world to navigate. 
So there's a lot of research that shows that that world is one in which bullying, for example, now follows you to any space that you can imagine. And you're going to have to deal with a lot of the stresses and anxieties that go with it. It's much harder to switch off when you come home from school, especially because social media apps have been designed to addict you to your phones. Notifications are the best example of which intrudes past your consciousness, no matter what you're doing, and tells you, come here, you need to see this. And this can be devastating to your ability to manage your mental health and the corpus of, un of knowledge that you imbibe as a person. So what you read and see and learn, because we're always learning, even me, and that's being decided by someone else. We've done our part and we're doing our part. And I recognize the responsibility that my generation and those before me hold. And so Center for Counter and Digital Hate, there are around 20 of us now. I and mean, I live in Washington, DC, where I lobby US legislators and speak to the US media and, and stakeholders and celebrities out here. We have a team in London as well, which does that in the UK. And we've been working extensively with the British government on the online safety bill, which seeks to make those environments safer for you. But there are things that you can do as well. First thing is thinking hard about who it is you want to associate with and who it is you want to decide the information that you get. You need to understand that you're on a structured platform that is feeding you information to its own interests when you're on social media. And it's look, I like looking at pictures on the Internet, too, uh, whether it's I mean, for me, it's mainly like, is there a nice jacket I can buy? Are there any pictures of my brother's kids? Um, there are various things that we like to look at, but I am very aware of how it is that that's being served up to me. Understanding that information ecosystem and getting yourself knowledgeable about it is really important. But there are things that you can do as well when it comes to things like how you engage with material online. So let me go through those mathematics that I talked about really early on when I said that we had a report, Don't Feed the Trolls, that was endorsed by this whole array of um, amazing people. Don't Feed the Th Trolls is the central insight to CCDH, which is that misinformation and hate gain visibility because we have programmed the, the algorithms that then serve information back to us. Let me explain. If the algorithm knows that we are more likely to engage with hate, then it will prioritize hate. It then becomes advantageous if you're the kind of person that cares only about attention and the visibility of your material, not the merits of the arguments within, to use the tactic of being rude, obnoxious, cantankerous, antagonistic, hateful, because that actually gets people to engage with that content. People click on it, they reply to it, they quote tweet it, whether they agree or disagree, and it promotes it. So the most important and the most powerful thing you can do to hate and misinformation on digital platforms specifically is don't engage. If you're a bad actor whose job it is to increase the visibility of your material, engagement literally programs the algorithms to amplify it. There are other types of bullies, and you know, you'll know this yourselves. There are some people that just get off on causing pain. And there's, a, there's again, a psychological term for it. It's called negative social potency. It's a professor called Avita March in Australia who's done a lot of work on how that's one of the motivating factors behind trolling. And one of the best things you can do with that, with someone who's motivated by negative social potency, who wants to see you in pain, who gets off on causing chaos and being a troublemaker, I guess it would be called in the vernacular, is to respond. They're looking for a response, a pain response, because that's what gives them pleasure. So don't give it to them. Ignore the comments, block the, hate, the hateful person, 
and move on. Take a break, maybe. You could even try reporting it to the platform, although our research shows that platforms are really bad at responding to it. But with some work from the Centre for Countering Digital Hate and with the growing awareness of politicians and the media about this problem, there may be changes in future, and I hope that we can deliver that for you. But in the meantime, do try and report it to the platforms. And remember why you're being targeted. You're essentially being used as a vessel for someone else's message. You get to decide your experiences online. You get to decide what you communicate online and what brand, therefore, you want to create for yourself. The most powerful brand in the world is not the person who's highlighting, you know, someone acting like a, I guess you're all uh, under 18, so I probably shouldn't use a swear word, but, you know, behaving badly. But what you should be doing is trying to be the person who brings positivity to that environment. The most powerful gift you can give when you see misinformation is to actually go and find some good information and promote that to the people that you have relationships with online. The most powerful gift you can give, say in a pandemic, is information from the NHS. You might actually save a life over it. Someone might see the misinformation, might see your information coming from the NHS, and it might stop them from falling for the nonsense. Think about that, the power of our ability to communicate and to communicate on, on digital platforms that are used by billions of people. So the ways to communicate pro-socially, proactively, and, and in, 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 in the interests of our society, in the interests of each other, is the most powerful tool that you can develop over the coming years. Some of you might even end up working in communications or in, in there are science communicators, there are communicators who try and persuade people towards tolerance, there are all sorts of people, but we also have a duty to do so within our normal lives. Your ability to zone out the negative and produce the positive is going to be one of the most substantial individual contributions that you will make to the world in your lifetime, especially on platforms which aren't going away. So information used to flow top down. It now flows that way as well, horizontally between us in a networked way. And your ability to, to, to bring the morality that you expect from yourself in the way that you deal with your friends, your family, your loved ones, to the way that you deal online, because we never behave online, offline, the way that sometimes we behave online. But our ability to actually bring the same values, morality, decision-making to our online spaces is going to be critical in how we mold the world that you live in, that your children will live in. I, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna speak very personally for a moment here. I, I admire anyone's ability to talk about the vulnerability they feel online and their mental health. Now, you may have experienced something which has hurt you or impacted you. You may have seen pictures, for example, which make you feel bad about yourself. You may have received trolling. You may have seen someone trolling you, someone trolling you love. Now, these things have a psychological impact and our ability to be both vulnerable and open in communicating horizontally to each other about how that feels and to not just say, well, that's online, that's not important. We are human beings. We are incapable of differentiating between the hurt that we feel online and offline. The same liquids are pumping through our brain, the neurotransmitters, the feelings, the sentiments. Um, will flow and can be really problematic. Um, talk to someone. And it is not your fault. Those systems are designed to addict you and those bad actors are using them in a way which is designed to trigger you. And just remember that it's not your fault, it's their fault. So again, I repeat the advice, block, ignore, 
block, take a mental health break, report it to the platform. So you've actually done something about it. And then communicate to someone about how you're feeling. Tell someone about the anxiety. You're not alone. And this is something that we're going to have to live with in our society, like it or not. We will try and abate some of the worst of it. But there's always going to be people that abuse the system that's zero cost to create harm. And think about it. I mean, look, here's the thing with information. You can harm our, you can harm our environment. And as long as the information flows accurately, and if we're able in our democracies to make collective decisions based on the wisdom of a, a whole society on ways to deal with it, we will find ways to deal with any crisis. But inf information flows are corrupted. That's when you blue screen your society. Our democracy, our ability to deal with the challenges, the other challenges that we will have to deal with over the coming decades and centuries is dependent upon us being able to constantly police, improve incrementally sometimes, so in small ways, but also in huge ways. The way in which information flows and decision making happens within our society. If one of you goes on to be the Einstein of this field, well, that will be a real joy. I'll probably never know, but you know, my kids will know and they'll benefit from it too. So for those of you that are interested in information, please, you know, follow us, go and look at the website, counterhate.com, follow us on Twitter, CCD hate, on Instagram, counterhate, and reach out, talk to each other. If you'd like, we'd be happy to have one of us come and talk to your school individually or you, if you don't know how to deal with things, there are lots and lots of places you can go to. There are community health resources. There are, if necessary, teachers, or if it's really serious, there are, there's of course law enforcement, but we're around as well because there's a whole community of us that understand that digital platforms have the potential to liberate humanity, but right now they're causing a lot of harm as well. And we wanna make sure that they fulfill their original promise because that promise is that of progress. Um, I'm sorry, that was somewhat rambling. Uh, I hope that, that something in there was valuable to you. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, chance to expand on some of my thoughts to an audience that I don't normally talk to. Um, and I'm happy now to take your questions. Great. So we actually have a few. We have um, one from a student at St. Joseph's Catholic High School in Slough. Um, and that is, um, you dress it slightly as well. And you have uh, answered it impartially. But um, is there, are there any ways that we can try and prevent online hate? So online hate is a, um, there, are, there are always people who are going to hate, right? We've been fighting this fight, trying to bend the moral arc of history towards justice and tolerance for a long time. But digital platforms have given people a unique ability to spread that hate at pace. And they've also given the ability to target individuals. And they've also given the ability to um, spread that across national borders. So one of the things that we can, so there's two things that we can do. The first thing is to be informed digital citizens. And I do encourage anyone to go and have a look if you're interested at Don't Feed the Trolls, which starts to lay out the, the mathematics and the rationale for why people use digital platforms and how they use digital platforms, which is that those are spaces in which they're able to to, to spread lies and misinformation at pace using the amplification effect of our interactions with that hate. So to trigger us into going, that's wrong. But every time we say that's wrong and you reply to a tweet, you actually promote that tweet. You republish it essentially. So there are, there are ways in to, to be an informed, good digital citizen. But there's also putting out the counter message. So each of us has an ability to put out the correct, the truth, the, the good aspects of being part of this society. And 
you know, one of the things that you learn as you get older is that you can't always persuade everyone just through your rhetoric. You have to make the best argument you can, let others make their argument, build up the trust and use the, the, the trust that people have in you because you behave in a way that isn't like hate actors to win that argument. The best way to win the argument is to focus on what you want to say, not on what the small number of extremely loud, artificially amplified, hate-filled voices are saying on digital platforms. Great, thank you. Um, we have a staff question as well. Um, how can we, parents, teachers, caregivers, build resilience in young children to prepare them for social media once they're adolescents? I mean, I, uh, I personally think the most fundamental lesson is to, is to help them understand what it is that those platforms are designed to do. And the first insight and the most central insight is that these are platforms that literally prioritize hate, disagreement, and misinformation over good information. These are essentially entertainment sites. And that the best way that they can understand the world around them is to go and experience it and understand it through dialogue directly with people themselves. Because there they'll find that we have many, many fewer differences and many, many fewer arguments and many, many points of agreement, um, many more points of agreement than we do points of disagreement. Um, it, is, it's, it is the same citizenship, um, the lessons in, in being members of a society that we would do for the offline world. But the, the need for them, I accept, is insanely acute right now because there is a counterforce. There is a counter enlightenment in digital spaces that's militating against our ability to make those positive arguments to children and to, to I mean, let's be frank, to each other. It's not that, it's not, you know, it's not, most of the people sending out hateful messages on social media platforms aren't young people. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from a staff member at Eton College. Um, he says, thank you for such a thoughtful lecture. You mentioned the idea of creating a brand for oneself. How can you use the algorithms to market one's positive brands rather than have, have this amplify negative social potency that you described? Well, I mean, it really, so, I mean, there is always going to be a platform bias towards the controversial, the the highly engaging. This, the, you know, there are there are fundamental aspects of human psychology, like like our our our, our sort of desire when we're surprised to go out and reach out and and try and understand the contours of something that surprises us, which is why clickbait works, for example. But there are. Um, in, in building our own brand, it's also about build, learning a few lessons from the way the other side works. So classes could, for example, reinforce each other's messages by agreeing to, be so coordinated behavior by trolls. What hate actors do is they're densely interconnected and highly active, and they agree to essentially promote each other. So like 50 trolls can produce 5,000 notifications in two, in two minutes. Each of them tweets, each of them retweets with a quote, so quote tweets, and then each of them likes each other's tweets, each other's tweet. That's 50 times 50 times two notifications on the target. And that's how 50, 50 people can, can look like they're 5,000. In fact, the way that we think about social media platforms, if you get 5,000 notifications, you think, you know, I've just, my, that, that, a hundred people must feel it for one to have said it. So we think half a million when in fact, so we multiply by a hundred rather than divide by a hundred, which would be the right way of doing it. But that same mathematics can work for us. So how do we create communities um, which reinforce our values? And I think, you know, one of the things that I've done before is done training for people in how to be social media, oh, it's a terrible term. It sounds really, really dorky, ninjas. Uh, to promote international development or other things, you know, climate action. And actually, it's about that mutual reinforcement and, and understanding that the tactics that are used by the other side. Again, I think that is actually this. I mean, it sounds like DFTT, um, Death of the Trolls, which is our first report. And I actually am embarrassed by it because I wrote it two and a half years ago. Uh, I think it's pretty bad now, but it's got a lot of that mathematics and understanding and the rules of physics of the digital world, which help us to understand how we can best promote pro-social messaging. 
Great, thank you. Um, there was a couple of questions as well that came via email. Um, so one of those was, what do you think the UK government um, could be doing to regulate the internet and how can this be done when the internet is worldwide? Well, I mean, can you regulate the internet? So at the moment, the internet, and, and I mean, let's just start from the beginning. How do we create values and, and norms of behavior in society? Is it just the government or is it society itself? So if you think about the ways in which we create the norms of behavior, um, those aren't for the main part le in legislation. They are actually mutual social contract and agreement. They're the norms of behavior. They're so what is called social mores. And I, I, you know, social mores are created by the norms of behaviors and attitudes are created by much more than legislation. So yes, there is legislative action that can be taken to, 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 to eliminate um, malignancies online, the problems online. And let me give you an example of how that can be done. So if you're making a car or if you run a cafe, you have a duty of care to your customers to take reasonable steps to ensure the safety of your product. There are no such rules on social media platforms. The problem we have at the moment is an absolute absence of regulation. And in the US, it goes even further. In 1996, before social media even existed, some genius decided to pass the Communications Decency Act 1996. Section 230 absolves any social media platform from any liability for third party content on their website. So if someone writes something on your website, you have no responsibility for it whatsoever. And that of course has created an absence of regulation. And what we are dealing with now is the only industry in the world in which in the US, you cannot apply the duty of care test. So the UK is actually legislating right now through something called the Online Safety Bill, which creates an active duty of care for platforms to make sure that misogyny is reduced on their platform, that racial hatred, that misinformation that may lead to loss of life. Um, and the government can designate the areas of harm that I mean, the bill is going through parliament at the moment. If you're a sort of parliamentary dork like I am, then you will know that actually it's going through. It's just finished its pre legislative scrutiny with a select committee, which is quite unusual to take the politics out of it, which um, Damien Collins MP chaired. Um, who's on the board of CCDH, and I actually was the first witness to that committee um, in September. The new legislation will come out in March, and then it should get through second, third, and second, third reading in the Commons pretty easily. There'll be some messing around with it in the Lords, and it will be law by the end of the year. So there will be a law which creates an active duty of care on companies regulated by Ofcom to reduce the harms. And, and that's really about, you know, you, you, at the moment, as I say, the platforms are designed to create wealth for the owners. Mark Zuckerberg being worth $100 billion already and younger than me. Um, and you think about uh, what, what it will say is, actually, Mark, maybe you've got enough money. Can you start putting safety as a core consideration in your product design? And I think that, that will lead to a revolution in the way that these products are thought through and in the way in which they're implemented. Great, thank you. Um, and we also have another question from a staff member. Um, do you have any advice for staff members approached by a student that is affected um, by online hate? And how, you know, how should they deal with that? So and look, the, the most useful thing that we can do in those moments, both student to student, but especially faculty to student is, is allyship and friendship. That it is really, it's really hard to see hate. Um, we, we, for example, have psychiatric counselling available for staff who are exposed to extreme hate online because we see a lot of bad stuff. But it, you need to be, I mean, you will know better than I do the statutory duties of care that you have to someone that may have been exposed to, re, to, to, trauma, to actual traumatising material. And I cannot tell you what the what the protocols are within, you know, for doing that. It's not my area of expertise. But the most important thing that you can do is support that individual and take it damn seriously because it's not just online. Our, our ability to differentiate between the two neurologically is nothing, zero. You know, we 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 have fight or flight 
reactions to a, a threat made online just as we would in person. Um, we have a, uh, the, the, the impact of these things can be very serious. And I, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't advise beyond that, but it is, it is a, it's, 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 it, it is a very difficult thing to deal with hate online. And um, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll leave you there. Great. Um, and another question just come through in the chat. Do you believe governments around the world will eventually act um, to control content on social platforms? I mean, I think that they will, they will help to articulate the parameters of what's acceptable and what's, what's completely unacceptable. Um, so at the moment, you know, terrorist material is already partly regulated through international uh, norms. Uh, so um, through customary international uh, law and through bodies like GIFCT, which is the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism. Um, which originates with the Christchurch process after the uh, man massacred people in Christchurch, um, Muslims in Christchurch. Um, and New Zealand has been leading on the cross-governmental work. As it happens, CCDH is actually convening governments in May in Washington to talk about um, ways in which we can have a de minimis, a minimum set of standards for, um, for what for how you can create levers to persuade big tech companies to reduce the amount of harmful material on their platforms. But there is a tension there with freedom and the ability of people to be wrong. People actually have a fundamental right to just be wrong about things. And there is also sometimes a very fine line between opinion and the and 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 a lie. And so these are really difficult areas to legislate, I wouldn't give them uh, too much stick for taking their time to work through some of those issues. And I know that there are good faith issues around the world. And, you know, I, 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 um, I can be a critic of Her Majesty's government, the US government and governments around the world when I need to be. Um, but I've seen real, uh, a real endeavor to, to build consensus globally on this issue because people know that it's really serious. It's affecting our ability to have progress and, and democracy, liberalism, tolerance, and, and decent societies. Great, thank you. Um, and another question that came through on the email, um, do you think less social media use um, can be beneficial to students that are affected negatively by online trolling? Yeah, I mean, like, I think it could be beneficial to everyone. Um, <laughs> look, social, me like, social media, like anything, is something to be done. Like, know what you're doing. It's, it's like having a Big Mac. This, it's not going to make you fat to have a Big Mac, but like you eat 50 Big Macs, you're going to get ill. Uh, so be aware of what it is that you're consuming. And that, I mean, I once said to an executive at Google, I was in a meeting with a government uh, talking about the pandemic and there was an executive from Google there and he was being particularly unctuous. Uh, if you don't know what that word means, look it up and use it because it's a fantastic word. Um, and he was saying, um, uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to stop this pandemic, Minister. And I said, I think a really good idea would be if you maybe put a notice on your website saying on YouTube saying this site is for entertainment purposes only. Please don't take any information here you see seriously because it could be sent by someone who wants to do you harm. And for a moment he went, that's a good idea. And then he realized what I'd said. And it's not a very good idea, actually. No, we couldn't possibly do that. But I do think, you know, we should have that in our heads every time we go on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook. This site is for entertainment purposes only. Some of the information you see here could actually do you harm. So just take it with a pinch of salt. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions then that we've had. Um, if anyone um, has any additional questions that they send to me after this event, are you happy for me to pass them on to you? Of course. Brilliant, thank uh, you so much. If, if I ever get re-invited to do it again, I'll try and be better. So, so you're brilliant, you made, 
No, you made some excellent, excellent points and really thought provoking points and, and practical things that some of our students can do. Um, you know, some of the things like putting on or, or passing on positive information to counteract some of that negative information. Um, you know, that, that's a, a brilliant example of something our, our students can do. You know, blocking trolls, um, another great um, thing, you know, practical thing. The, 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 the two other things, although most, I think a lot of young people know this already, like check your privacy settings on all the social media apps you do. And just think, like in the worst case, would I want this to be private or not? Second thing is notifications. Like just be aware of how much notifications drain your ability to focus. So, I mean, someone, I, I did a lecture at Harvard a few few months ago and there's these students ask me like, how many followers do you need to be influential? And this is off the back of President Biden having used our work. And I said, I told them the truth, which is, I think I've got 5,000 or 6,000 followers or something on Twitter, like nothing, but I'm listened to by presidents. And it's not because of the, the size of following I've got, but of how hard I've thought through the arguments and evidence that I present. Um, you know, the most important thing that we can do is not say our opinions most loudly or to the most people is to have the best formed opinions and that still means going back to basics when it comes to developing ourselves as human beings and our brand you want to be remembered as as the person that contributed something substantial to the world not to the person who said the wrong thing most loudly i think that those words i think we're going to finish there thank you so much Imran, for your time and your expertise um, I'm sure we'll get some really positive feedback from this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, bye.